I'm Bonnie Clearwater. I'm the director and chief curator of NSU Art Museum. And I'm very happy to see at 5 o'clock on a Saturday uh, such a full house. Um, this has been very exciting. The show is amazing. And you're the first ones that are getting to see it. Um, it is my pleasure, first of all, to recognize the sponsors of the exhibition, uh, the, um, the indestructible Lee Miller. And um, believe me, we could not have done this show without their support. So I would like to um, have you all thank David and Francie Horvitz Family Foundation, Paula and Jean Stevens, and David and Susan Samarick Foundation. And I'm especially pleased to see that I, we have a quorum in the house from our Board of Governors. And um, so thank you for showing such great support. And I particularly would like to acknowledge the museum's um, board chairman, uh, David Horvitz, and his wife, Francie. It's through your dedication and leadership that we are it says becoming the premier cultural destination. We are the premier cultural destination in, in South Florida. Um, I'd like to thank you, um, spend, give a special thanks to the museum staff who once again has pulled off an amazing triumph. I'd also like to thank someone very special in the audience tonight my very good friend, Rosalind Jacobs, who was a longtime friend of Lee Miller's. She knew Miller's genius and introduced me to Miller's son, Anthony Penrose. And this introduction resulted in the exhibition we are premiering this evening. Thank you, Roz, for the inspiration and encouragement and for traveling from New York with your entourage uh, for this event. It is my distinct pleasure now to introduce our guest speaker, Anthony Penrose, director of the Lee Miller Archives and the Penrose Collection. Mr. Penrose is the son of the American photographer Lee Miller, who was a fashion model for Vogue, Vanity Fair. She collaborated with the surrealist photographers, particularly with Man Ray. She was a fashion photographer and a war correspondent and combat photographer. And if that wasn't enough, she was a gourmet chef. <laughs> Anthony Penrose's father was Roland Penrose, a surrealist artist and a poet who founded the Institute of Contemporary Art in 1947 in London. And he was the bi biographer of Picasso, Moreau, Man Ray, and Tapius. What an amazing background and childhood. He grew up in Farley Farm House, the old Sussex farmhouse his parents used to occupy in the village of Chittingly. Life was a perpetual arts congress where British artists like Henry Moore and Richard Hamilton mixed with leading figures from Europe such as Max Ernst, um, Juan, Juan Moreau, and uh, Jean Dubuffet, and where Picasso visited in 1950. Now, I visited the farm last year, and Chittingly is only a one-road winding town, and it's amazing to think that Picasso was wandering around this little farm town um, in 1950. Anthony Penrose and his late wife, Suzanne, founded the Lee Miller Archives in 1978, following the discovery of his mother's work in the attic of the family farmhouse. Today, the 60,000 plus negatives, 20,000 vintage prints, manuscripts, letters, and maps form the source material for books and exhibitions all over the world. The collection is ma managed by his daughter, Amy Buhasner, who is the co-director of the archive, who I would like to thank for all her assistance in coordinating the exhibition and for her work this week on the installation. 
Just as we tapped into Freedom Mania last year with our Kahlo, Rivera, and Mexican Modern Art Show, there is now a groundswell of exhibitions focusing on Lee Miller's work. Besides this exhibition that we co-organized in association with the Albertina in Vienna, an exhibition just closed at the Sc Scottish National Portrait Gallery of Lee Miller and Picasso. And coming up next week is Lee Miller and World War II at the Imperial War Museum in London. The title is Lee Miller, A Woman's War. Clearly, and, and there is also a surrealist exhibition of Lee Miller running in Mexico as we speak. Anthony and Amy have a lot on their plate, so I am especially grateful that they have d devoted so much time to this exhibition. By the way, besides writing Lee Miller's War, War Anthony Penrose has written a children's book called The Boy Who Bit Picasso. And he has graciously uh, signed the, both books and was willing to um, personalize them during the opening. Um, I would like to mention he no longer bites. <laughs> now, please welcome Anthony Penrose. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. This was my very first visit to the Everglades here in Florida in 1953. <laughs> That's my mum being a parrot stand. Her name was Lee Miller. You may have already encountered her, in which case, did you discover her through the work of Man Ray, for whom she posed for some of his most celebrated images? Or did you find her as a woman whose libertine ways made her a symbol for the sexual revolution, and who along the way left a trail of deliciously erotic images? Or did you get to know of her as Vogue magazine's glamorous war correspondent, elegantly dressed in her Savile Row uniform, who endured more than 30 days under fire and became as battle-hardened as the toughest soldiers? The woman for whom the phrase, up close and personal, might well have been coined. At seven years old, Lee Miller was a total tomboy. She was the kind of girl that polite mothers in her hometown of Poughkeepsie, New York, would not let their daughters play with. Her father was an engineer. Her mother was a nurse. There were two brothers, Eric and John. And Theodore, Lee's father, encouraged her to play rough, adventurous, and often dangerous games with her brothers from a very early age. As a young woman, she escaped to New York City, where she worked as a dancer in a chorus line, and then she enrolled in the Art Students League. One day in Manhattan, she stepped off the pavement right in front of an oncoming truck. She should have been killed in that moment, but a man was watching. He snatched her from the path of the truck. She fainted into his arms. Good choice, Lee. His name was Condé Nast, the owner of Vogue magazine <laughs> and Vanity Fair. In his arms, he saw the face that he had been looking for. And very quickly, she appeared on the very front cover of Vogue, March 1927, drawn by Georges Le Pape. Start as you mean to go on. And certainly, she engaged the attention of Edward Steichen, Vogue's chief photographer. And Steichen found that she had the most perfect looks for the beautiful evening dresses, for the casual wear, for the sports wear. And his photographs made her into what we would today call a supermodel, coast to coast, Vogue and Vanity Fair. But she packed it all in. She announced, I would rather make a picture than be one. She wanted to become a photographer, 
And Steichen gave her an introduction to Man Ray, the American surrealist photographer who lived and worked in Paris. Lee boarded a liner and went to find him. I found Man Ray's studio in Rue Campagne Première, but the concierge told me he'd gone to Baritz for his holiday. So I went across the street to have a drink in the Bado Ivre. I was sipping a perno when he kind of rose up through the floor at the top of a circular staircase. He looked like a bull with an extraordinary torso and very dark eyebrows and dark hair. I told him boldly I was his new student. I don't take students and anyway I'm leaving Paris. I'm going to Biarritz for my holiday. I know, but I'm going with you. And I did. <laughs> Lee became Man Ray's pupil, his lover, and his model for his fashion work and his source of inspiration. But their relationship was deeply conflicted by Man Ray's possessive jealousy. Man Ray was at the front of the surrealist movement and he believed that along with all other bourgeois values, marriage was superfluous, families were redundant, and l'amour fou, free love, was the true form. Men held they should be allowed to have as many lovers as they chose, but they strongly disapproved of women having the same freedom. Lee would not tolerate this double standard. And she had as many lovers as she wanted. And Man Ray nearly went mad with jealousy. But Lee just sailed blithely along above it all. But Man Ray, though jealous, was generous. He was generous in his encouragement of Lee as a photographer. I don't know what camera she has here, but her camera of preference for the next 30 years was a Rolleiflex. She bought one of the first, and her early works, mostly taken in the vicinity of the studio, show she developed a strong surrealist style right from the start. She used the camera like a cookie cutter, snipping pieces out of life. It's like the found image. You know how the surrealists love the found object. Well, this is what Lee was doing with images, just finding quirky things and giving them back to us. She titled this, Exploding Hand. It does look as though the woman's hand has gone up in a puff of smoke. But actually, the backstory is that this door belongs to the Guerlain perfume shop in Paris. And so many of the clientele have been wearing diamond rings that the diamonds have scratched that opaque area onto the glass. <laughs> now, most of us would walk past that without noticing it. But Lee waited until the woman with the beautiful couture gown, with the manicure, with the diamond ring, put her hand on the handle, and in that moment, that soft shutter on the roller flex went schnick, and she gave us back this moment stolen from place and time. She loved making quirky pictures. This is Charlie Chaplin. He's just filming, finished filming City Lights, and maybe Lee's saying he's still carrying his own lights around with him. But these shots did not pay bills. In her commercial work, Lee began being her own model. And this shot was published in September 1930 in French Vogue, where she's paired with another of her own shots for Chantel on the same page that was published in American Vogue. September 1930. She had been a photographer for less than one year, and here she was, published in Vogue. If we look at other influences, perhaps you can see the work of Edward Weston in Lee's Nudes. But there's something interesting about the way pho Lee photographs women. Women photographing women is a very different thing from men doing the, doing the same thing. She has avoided making this woman into an erotic com a comedy, um, <coughs> commodity, and that is, I think, the big difference. But when it comes to influence, there's no doubt about the influence of this wonderfully crazy woman called Claude Cahoon. She was a surrealist photographer who lived in Jersey, and she took this photograph which immediately caught Lee's attention. She's photographed herself 
underneath one of those glass domes. Now, you will have seen glass domes like this in museums, and they usually contain some precious thing, maybe a little stuffed animal or a bird that's there as a trophy to enhance the status of the owner. And Lee was immediately fascinated by the metaphor here because she, as a beautiful woman, was constantly fighting off men who wanted to turn her into a trophy. So she positioned her close friend, Tanja Ram, under the dome and made her own version. Man Ray shared the session. He blindfolded Tanja, thus reducing her even further to a helpless captive. And then, much later, he included her in a painting, Aline et Velcourt, the man leaning back, smug, self-satisfied, gloating over his beautiful trophy. This business of trying to control Lee Miller was something that Man Ray obsessed about. He titled this photograph, Suicide. Why? I don't know. But some years later, in fact in 1937, Paul Eluard invited him to illustrate this book of Eluard's poetry, Les Mains Libres. Now, a photogravure was far too expensive for a photography book, so Man Ray drew the image like this. You can see he followed the photograph almost perfectly. But in the foreground, there's a knife. Perhaps that's the suicide instrument. And then there's a letter. Maybe that's the suicide note. But the amazing thing that really blew me out when I saw it is the shadow. Can you see? It's composed of Man Ray's name. M-A-N-R-A-Y. And the date. It's anamorphic writing, so to see it properly, you have to stand where I am on the edge. And if you do, that's what you get. Think of the metaphor. It's five years on since Lee has left him. Do you think he regards himself as still being in her shadow after all this time? Oh, I so wish I knew. Lee certainly was the inspiration, if not the inventor, for Man Ray's solarization technique. That's the technique that puts this amazingly beautiful dark line around the image. The story that she told is that she was dish developing some plate negatives. You do this in total darkness. You put the negative in a little dish, you put the developer in it, and you rock it to and fro. It takes about four or five minutes. And Lee was doing this in darkness, and while she was doing it, a rat ran over her foot. She let out a shriek. She snapped on the white light. You do not do that when you're dish developing negatives. Man Ray let out an even bigger shriek and snapped off the light, grabbed the negative, dumped it in the fixer to stop the process. And when they looked at it and printed it, they found this extraordinary effect had taken place. And then they really had to work at it because they wanted to reproduce it at will and they couldn't always rely on the rat showing up at the precise moment. <laughs> But they made it. Now, when you look at this picture, it's a bit clunky, isn't it? There's a lot of not much happening in the lower part. Great big hand. But actually, that's deliberate. Man Ray shot wide to crop tight. And this is the version that you're probably used to seeing and you will certainly see in the exhibition. And solarization became kind of like the hallmark of their artistic collaboration. They used it a lot. And personally, I think the way Lee has photographed herself like this against that black background is a prelude to using the image for solarization. But this one obviously never made it through that stage. Lee and Man Ray worked very, very closely together. And Man Ray often used to pass Lee assignments for fashion work so that he could get on with his painting. Images like this were published attributed to Man Ray. But Lee said, it didn't matter. We were so close. It was as if we were the same person. But there was one time when they fell out in a spectacular way, and that was over this image. Man Ray had taken this picture of Lee. He was dissatisfied. He threw it out. Lee fished the negative out of the trash and started printing. And she must have gone through several states of contrast and different papers 
And finally, it was shoot wide, crop tight that saved the day. And this is the image she took to show Man Ray. What do you think of that, she said. Wow, he said, that is amazing. Because it is. But then the fight started. Was it Lee's picture because she made it from Man Ray's discarded negative? Or was it Man Ray's picture because he shot it in the first place? Absolutely tearing row. Man Ray threw Lee out of the studio. When she came back four days later, she found a copy of the photograph nailed to the wall. The throat had been slashed with a razor and red ink streamed down from the cut. Much later, Man Ray painted this picture titled Le Logiste d'Artiste. It means the artist's abode. And he placed Lee's wounded neck in his studio among the things that he owns, his inanimate possessions. And perhaps that's much more revealing than he intended it to be. Because like I said, he was always struggling to control this uncontrollable woman. This image is in the exhibition. You'll notice that Man Ray signed it. It's beautiful, but it has a story. Because it comes from a triptych, there's a series of three photographs that Man Ray took nearly the, near the beginning of their relationship, and they show a tenderness, a lyricism, at the fact that he was so in love with this woman. But the image that he wants us and the rest of the world to see is the one where he sheared off her head. He's reduced her to a beautiful, inanimate, erotic object, devoid of any possibility of answering him back, devoid of intelligence, devoid of any challenge at all. After a while, Lee began to get a bit fed up with people chopping her into small pieces. And one of the turning points came when the manufacturer of glassware in Paris announced that he had designed the shape of his latest champagne glass based on the shape of Lee Miller's breast. I really think that did it. Because in this moment, Lee was working as a commercial photographer and one of her jobs was photographing technical procedures in surgery. And one day she was invited by a surgeon to photograph the operation of a radical mastectomy. When the operation was over, Lee asked the surgeon for the breast. She put the breast on a plate, she covered it with a cloth, she carried it through the streets of Paris to Vogue Studios, where she set it down on a table. I'm going to show you the photograph she took. You may not want to see it, so this is a good moment to close your eyes if you're liable to be offended, because she just got two shots off. She positioned it on a beautiful napkin, firmly pressed with a knife and a fork and a spoon. She got two shots off before Hoening and Hune, the studio boss, found out what she was up to and threw her and the breast out in the street. What do you think was on her mind? Well, I've no hard evidence for this, but what I think she was saying in this moment is, okay, men, you like my breasts. I know you do, you're always looking at them, but you forget that it's just tissue. And behind that breast, there's a woman with a heart and a soul and a mind of her own. And all you see is breasts. Well, if you want one so much, have it, eat it. It's yours. What better place to make that process than Vogue Studios? Actually, in that moment, there was another volcanic eruption brewing under Man Ray's life, which was nothing to do with breasts or anything else. It was to do with this guy, Jean Cocteau, and he was about as gay as you could get, so it was not going to be a love affair that upset Man Ray. It was something actually even worse, because Cocteau had actually captured the attention of the people in the theater box here, the Vicomte and Vicomtesse de Noailles. Normally, they sponsored Man Ray's productions, but now, 
They gave the money to Cocteau to make his latest feature film called Le Sang d'un Poet. Now this was a huge blow to Man Ray. And what made it even worse was that Cocteau cast Lee in the leading role as the statue. She had plaster of Paris false arms. Her hair was made up with a mixture of butter and flour that threatened to turn into a croissant under the studio lights. <laughs> the story is the poet falls in love with the sculpture, but he can't control her. Hey, is there a theme here? So he destroys her. But she comes back to life. She challenges him to a game of cards. He loses, he shoots himself. By now she has eyes painted on her eyelids so she can see whatever state she's in. And the film ends with her departing, leading an ox with a map painted on its side. The finished film drew violent condemnation, but it was a great success for Cocteau and a great grief for Man Ray. And in that moment, I believe that that's what caused him to make this object. It was titled, Object to be Destroyed. He knew that one day somebody would, so he wrote a poem to accompany it. Cut out the eye from a portrait of one who has been loved, but is seen no more. Attach the eye to the pendulum of a metronome and regulate the weight to suit the tempo desired. Keep going to the limit of endurance. And with a hammer well aimed, try to destroy the hole with a single blow. Lee claimed it was like making a wax voodoo effigy to stick pins into, and she had some justification because it was her eye on the pendulum of that metronome. The end of the affair came when Lee left Paris 11th of October 1932 and returned to New York. And Man Ray was demented with but he found a way through. He painted this picture. It's big. It's two meters wide. It took him two years to paint. And it has two titles. One title is Le de l'Observatoire. Observatory time, because those are the twin domes of the Observatoire de Montparnasse, and that positions the lips just about above Man Ray's studio in Montparnasse. The other title is Les Amoureux, the lovers, because the lips morph into the closely entwined form of two lovers, Lee and Man Ray, perhaps, and of course, they derive from Lee's lips, which Man Ray cross-hatched to enlarge. But the genius of the painting is the way the lips are tilted. That enables them to fly freely in the early morning sky above Paris. It is the moment he kissed her farewell. He forgave her and he continued to love her right to his dying day. In New York, in the teeth of the depression, Lee founded her own studio. Her Parisian chic made her way ahead of the American photographers when it came to pack shots for the big stores. She used herself as a model. The purpose of this shot was to advertise the hairband made of a revolutionary new material called plastic. And when it made it into Vogue, March 1933, Lee's credited as photographer and model. And then the portrait customers began to arrive. Mary Taylor, Lillian Harvey. These women were actresses on Broadway who wanted arresting images to send to Hollywood casting directors. The studio was a tremendous success and about two years into its run, suddenly this guy shows up. His name, Aziz Eloui Bey. He had met Lee in Paris when Lee photographed Aziz's wife, who was called Nimet, who was known as one of the seven most beautiful women of her day. Lee was another of the seven. Aziz divorced Nimet. He arrived in New York. He asked Lee to marry him. To everybody's absolute astonishment, she did. And she went back to live with him in Cairo. To begin with, she relished the sheltered life, pampered as an expatriate, 
But very quickly, boredom set in. She called these people the black satin and pearl set, and she was bored witless. So she grabbed her camera and began making long-range excursions into the desert. She photographed the Great Pyramid of Cheops, not from the bottom, but from the top. And there's a metaphor here, because that shadow stretches out over the land and the dwellings of the ordinary people in just the same way as the influence of the pharaohs stretched out over the land of Egypt. And then way off in the Western desert, she made this portrait. Portrait of space, she called it. I feel it's an image of longing for freedom. She's ripping through that gauze, that fly screen, wanting to escape down the road, perhaps seeking that bird, or is it a cloud, or is it a bird that's flying in the sky? But she's left a little hatch, a portrait frame, portrait of space, and that space is her gift to you to fill with your imaginings and your dreams and perhaps your longings. But not even desert travel was enough to satisfy Lee's yearning. And Aziz, ever indulgent, bought her an airplane ticket to Paris. On the night she arrived in June 1937, she went to a fancy dress ball. There she met a quiet, shy Englishman, a surrealist artist who knew his way around Paris. But in that moment, he said he experienced the sensation of being struck by lightning. He was never the same again. His name was Roland Penrose. He was later to be my dad, but he didn't know that at the time. <laughs> he took Lee around Europe, and they ended up on the Côte d'Azur in a wonderful surrealist summer camp. On the left, that's Paul and Nush Eluard. He's the surrealist poet. On the right, in the white hat, that's Man Ray. And the first serious girlfriend in his life since Lee has left five years early, that is she, Adi Fidelin. And there in the middle, that's what a tweedy, uptight Englishman looks like when he's hanging out with a woman of his dreams in the south of France. <laughs> there should have been two other people at that picnic, Picasso and Dora Ma. But they'd had a row that morning, they'd stayed behind to cool off, and Picasso took a really big interest in Lee. In fact, he painted her. He painted her six times, a la Arlesienne, like a woman from Arles, because the women from Arles are known for being very beautiful. Roland bought this one, and he gave it to my mum as a present. And it hung in our home when I was growing up and it was so embarrassing because my school chums would come along and they'd look at that and they'd snigger, eh, does your mum really look like that? <laughs> cool, she's scary. But then I began to decode the painting. Look at the yellow face. No, it's not about jaundice. It's a metaphor. He's given her sunshine yellow for the intense warmth of her personality and the brilliance of her intellect. Just check the picture. Do you see that warmth and that intelligence coming through? It's amazing how much Picasso captured of her in the painting. The following year, Lee and Roland met in Athens and they traveled by road all the way up through Bulgaria into Romania. They were photographing all the time. Lee left us about 700 shots, documenting what she and Roland saw as the end of an era because they knew the war was coming and they knew the lives of these people would be trashed forever. And Lee was not wrong because when she went back to Romania after the war, she had great difficulties in surviving, in, in finding any survivors among the Roma. They had mostly been murdered by the Nazis. Aziz knew that Lee was unhappy. And in 1939, after he had met Roland, he let her go. He gave her money. He gave her his enduring love. And he gave her a boat ride ticket to London. Incredible generosity. Incredible bad timing, because Lee arrived in London on the very first day of the Second World War. 
She started work as a freelance photographer for Vogue magazine. And then the Blitz began. And when it reached its full ferocity in 1940, Vogue Studios got hit three times and Lee wrote to her parents back home in America. It became a matter of pride that work went on. The studio never missed a day, bombed once and fired twice, working with the neighboring buildings still smoldering, the horrid smell of wet, charred wood, the stink of cordite, trying fire hoses still up the stairs, and we had to wade barefoot to get in. Little restaurants producing food on a primer's stove, carrying water to flush the toilets, and whoever could, taking the prints and negatives home to do at night, if they had the sacred combination of gas, electricity, and water. In fact, we slept on the floor of the kitchen corridor and sometimes had 10 or more friends, either bombed out of their own flats or isolated by the presence of a time bomb, or just thinking that Hampstead was safer. When the studio had no electricity, Lee went out in the street. Some shots show us a tranquil elegance, but others deliberately include the menace of war. This seemingly relaxed shot on Hampstead Heath shows the barrage balloons floating in the sky, a deliberate inclusion as is the barbed wire in this shot. There's a subtext behind these pictures. America was not yet in the war, and we wanted to appeal to you people to come and help us. So the lady in her Digby Morton suit stands in front of a background that achingly conveys the bashing London was taking at that time. And that bashing gave Lee so many surrealist opportunities. She called this Remington silent. That was the name of the typewriter. But no, it's not silent now. That photograph gives you thousands of words. It was the titling that was the joke. She called this nonconformist chapel, bridge of sighs. 1942, after Pearl Harbor, American, America entered the war and the US armed forces began arriving in vast numbers. Among them, the Life magazine reporter, David E. Sherman, who was to become Lee's wartime buddy. It was Sherman who suggested Lee applied for military accreditation and she was soon equipped with a chic uniform and her own AGO pass card, which gave her privileged access to military areas. And she was off photographing the women at war, the ATS searchlight crew, the Wren torpedo mechanics, skilled, dangerous, dirty jobs. If she gets it wrong, there's enough explosives stacked up around her to take the whole of Gosport off the map. The Allies landed in Normandy on D-Day, June the 6th, 1944. The beachheads held thousands of Allied lives, bought us a toehold in Europe. Women nurses had been there since the landings, but it was not until July Lee and other women journalists were allowed to go. She flew in to the US 44th Evacuation Hospital at Breckville, behind Omaha Beach. And she wrote, They'd been working on the fourth patient for over two hours. Blood was being slowly transfused into his left arm. Because of his chest wounds, they couldn't turn him over onto his back, so he was held up. And the surgeon, half kneeling, probed several deep holes by the beam of a common GI flashlight. The anaesthetist, a nurse, spoke sharply. The surgeon stopped. The patient was lowered and mask and transfusion were whisked off. In these few minutes, his face had turned dark blue. His eyes opened, glazed. Then he gasped slowly and started to breathe normally through the tube. He came alive again, for good. I had thought him dead. Lee filed over 10,000 words and more than 40 rolls of film, and her stories dominated Vogue features for the next year and a half. On Lee's next assignment, she crossed the boundary forbidden to women. She stumbled on a full-scale battle at the port of San Malo and instantly became a combat photographer. 
She wrote, The boy at the phone said they hear airplanes. We waited. Then I heard them swelling in the air like I've heard them vibrating over England on some such mission. This time, they were bringing their bombs to the crouching stonework 700 yards away. They were on time. Bombs away! A sickly death rattle as they straightened themselves out and plunged into the citadel. Deadly hit. For a moment, I could see where and how. Then it was swallowed up in smoke, belching, mushrooming and columning, towering up, black and white. Our house shuddered and stuff flew in at the windows. More bombs crashing, thundering, flashing, like Vesuvius, the smoke rolling away in a sloping trail. A third lot. The town reeled in the blast. A large breach had been made, and we waited for the next attack. I sheltered in a kraut dugout, squatting under the ramparts. My heel ground into a dead, detached hand. And I cursed the Germans for the sordid, ugly destruction they'd conjured up in this once beautiful town. I wondered where my friends that I'd known before the war were. How many had been forced into disloyalty and degradation? How many had been shot starved, or what? I picked up the hand and hurled it across the street and ran back the way I'd come, bruising my feet and crashing in the unsteady piles of stone and slipping in blood. Christ, it was awful. It was indeed awful. But it served only as a small taste of the horrors to come. In the meantime, there was a short respite as Lee covered the liberation of Paris. She found Jean Cocteau had survived various persecutions and he was living now with Jean Marais in the little entresol flat in the Palais Royal. And Picasso, he whirled her off, his, off her feet, exclaiming, this is incredible. The first allied soldier I have seen is a woman, and she is you? <laughs> Lee got a room in the Hotel Scribe, which was the allied press camp, and Sherman moved in next door. And Sherman described her room as a cross between a pig pen and an arms dump. By now, the Germans had their backs to their own frontier and were fighting with incredible ferocity. But in the early spring, the Allies began their advance into Germany at several points. Lee reached Cologne, where the Allied bombing had destroyed half the city. On to Frankfurt, with the bridges down, people queuing to cross in small boats. And she pressed on to Leipzig, arriving on the 19th of April, the day it was captured, and the town hall revealed deaths Lee did not lament. The love of death, which is the underpattern of the German living, caught up with the high officials of the regime. They gave a great party, toasted death and Hitler, and poisoned themselves. In one of the offices, a grey-haired man, Alfred Freiburg, Burgermeister of Leipzig, sits with his head bowed on his crossed arms on the desk. Opposite him, sprawled back in a chair, is a faded woman, eyes open and a trickle of blood on her chin. Leaning back on the sofa is a girl with extraordinarily pretty teeth, waxen and dusty. Her nurse's uniform is sprinkled with plaster from the battle for the city hall which raged outside after their deaths. Sherman told me that by the end of the war, Lee had been under fire for more than 30 days. But there was no horror that could prepare her for the liberation of the concentration camps. She witnessed at least four. Ordurf, Penning, Buchenwald, and Dachau, where she arrived 30th of April, 1945, the day after its liberation. To their everlasting credit, Vogue published Lee's dispatches, mainly in the American edition. She wrote, I implore you to believe this is true. I don't normally take pictures of horrors, but don't imagine that there's a town or village in Germany without them. There's no question about the inhabitants of the town of Dachau knowing what went on. 
The railway siding into camp runs fast past quite a few swell villas, and the last train of dead and semi-dead deportees was long enough to extend past them. The cars are still full of skeletal dead, and the path beside the trains are littered with the fleshless bodies of those who tried to get out and walk to their execution. During the liberation of Paris, the war had become very personal to Lee. She found a great many of her friends were missing. Poets, artists, teachers, journalists, anyone considered a dissident, and most of her Jewish friends had been taken. As she looked into the faces of the dead and the semi-dead, she would have been searching, trying to find her missing friends. That night, Lee and Sherman found a very exclusive billet in Munich. It was the only building in town to have hot water. So Lee hopped in the tub. And then they realized they had a scoop. They were in Hitler's house. Sherman took her picture. They carefully put this photograph by Heinrich Hoffmann on the edge of the tub. The image was a sacred Nazi icon used in the most popular posters of that time all over Germany. Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer, one people, one nation, one Führer. This was the Nazi icon and putting it beside the bath was a perfectly calculated insult. But it's not the Hoffman photograph in this picture that's the key. It's Lee's combat boots, because they're stamping the filth and the ash of Dachau into Hitler's pristine bath mats. She's not there as a guest. She's there as a victor. And there's something else, completely unknown and unknowable to Lee and Sherman. At that moment, at 4.45 in the afternoon, way across Germany in Berlin, Hitler and Eva Braun had just killed themselves. When Lee had finished scrubbing herself, Sherman got in after her. Lee photographed him, but you will notice that she has tilted the camera up. That includes the shower head. That morning in Dachau, they had seen the gas chambers which were disguised as communal showers. But now this shower head is rendered harmless as it hangs over Sherman's head. Sherman was Jewish. They stayed a few days in Hitler's apartment, looted some souvenirs, and then they were off to witness the capture of Wochenfeld, Hitler's fortress home as Berchtesgaden. The retreating SS had set fire to the building and together Lee and Sherman witnessed what they described as the funeral pyre of the Third Reich. The war ended a few days later. But Lee would not, could not quit. She doubled back across Europe to witness the liberation of Denmark. She loved the Danes. They were kind to her, and she respected all they had done to protect the Jewish people of that country. How wonderful it is to have the Hell Heston group shown in the gallery next to Lee's work, particularly as Lee and Roland became very close friends to the Danish artist Aska Jorn, who designed this cover. But Lee wanted to see what had happened in Eastern Europe, so she went to Vienna. This building is the Albertina Museum where the show originated. It looked very different when Lee arrived in 1945. The fighting had reduced much of the city to ruins. In the burned out shell of the Vienna Opera House, the soprano Ermgard Siegfried sang an aria from Madame Butterfly in a symbolic triumph of art over destruction. But there were few triumphs in the nearby Wilhelmina Children's Hospital, where the black marketeers had stolen all the drugs exactly as was portrayed in the movie The Third Man. Lee wrote in a dispatch that was unsurprisingly never published in Vogue. For an hour, I watched a baby die. He was dark blue when I first saw him. He was the dark, dusty blue of these waltz-filled Vienna nights. 
the same colour as the striped garb of the Dachau skeletons. The same imaginary blue as Strauss's Danube. I thought all babies looked alike, but that was healthy babies. There are many faces for the dying. This wasn't a two-month baby. He was a skinny gladiator. He gasped and fought and struggled for life. And a doctor and a nun and I just stood there and watched. There was nothing to do. In this beautiful children's hospital with its nursery rhymed walls and screenless windows, its clean white beds, its brilliant surgical instruments and empty drug cupboards, there was nothing to do but watch him die. This tiny baby fought for his only possession, life as if it might be worth something and as if there weren't a thousand more right there on the doorstep of the hospital waiting for a bed and a Zarina for their losing battle. Bitterness welled up in Lee's soul. Greed and stupidity were still destroying innocent lives. The war had failed to deliver the brave new world and that crushed Lee. The thousands of refugees who were flooding across Europe formed a procession of endless suffering as they and liberated prisoners of war tried to get back to their homes if they still had homes and countries to get back to. Lee had a home to go to. Roland welcomed her back. They married in 1947, a few months before I was born, but Lee's pictures remained seared into her mind. Today we would understand her condition as post-traumatic stress disorder, but then it was just simply not understood. We had no cure, just whiskey, and she drank to try and blot out the memories and unsurprisingly entered into a downward spiral of depression and alcohol abuse. Part of the brilliance of Bonnie's programming around this exhibition is that she's invited Dr. Stephen Gould, lecturer of, uh, in, in, um, in psychological trauma, to do his lecture, Depictions of Psychological Trauma in Fine Art, Expressing the Inexpressible, here, October the 18th. And that, for me, is a wonderful segue to Lee's exhibition. Lee's trauma her depression, her alcohol abuse, lasted for 20 years. And in my opinion, her finest achievement in her whole life was clawing her way up out of this. And it was cooking that saved her life as she reinvented herself as a surrealist cook and hit the kitchen head on. And we had dishes like blue spaghetti, green chicken, gold meatloaf, and pink breasts made of cauliflower. <laughs> Picasso visited in 1950. He and I made instant friends, for that is me. It is true, I did bite him, but he forgave me very quickly. <laughs> that was after he had bitten me right back. Juan Miro loved the color and the tranquility of the garden. But I'd just like you to note the jug on the table. You can find a very similar one here in the Picasso ceramics show. The guy that I loved most when he came was Man Ray, because no matter how black Lee's mood was, suddenly she brightened up. She became happy, cheerful, laughing. What this told me, particularly when you see the way those two are looking into each other's eyes, what I learned from this as a young person is that love, when it's real, is a thing that lasts forever. And it's not just about looking good when you're young, although I guess that can help. <laughs> there is one of Lee's reinventions of herself that did not look as though it was gonna work out too well. And that was being a mother. Roland, years before ultrasound, painted Lee like this and predicted my appearance <laughs> like this. <laughs> My family will tell you I was so much better looking in those days. <laughs> My debut as a fashion model came on the front cover of the Vogue Woolies book, and 
they stuck a silly hat on my head and I made it into the Christmas issue of Vogue. And when the magazine is closed, I bury my face in the ample bosom of Diamond Lil on the opposite page. <laughs> I've been doing that for years. I grew up in the times when Lee was in great difficulty with alcohol abuse and I became very remote from her. But I had a farm to grow up on and the people on the farm became an extended family. But best of all, this woman moved in to my life when I was about four. She was called Patsy Murray. She became my nanny. She became my de facto mum. She looked after me. She gave me all the love and the care that I needed. She was in my life for more than 57 years. I didn't know Lee during her lifetime, really. We were always embattled or she was someplace else. We fought like crazy. But luckily, I married this lady, Susanna. And as a young bride, courageously, she used to invite this formidable gourmet cook round to dinner at every opportunity in our home. And in that atmosphere, Lee and I became friends. It was nothing filial, but we found an affectionate respect for each other. Lee lived just long enough to meet her granddaughter, Amy, but she never met Eli Amy's sister, Eliza. But as both little girls grew up, they shared a very striking resemblance to their grandmother in her early years. But I have to say, Susanna and I had severe doubts about Lee Miller's suitability as a role model for our daughters. <laughs> I can say I really only discovered Lee as a mother through studying her work and piecing together, piecing together her lives, helped by David Sherman and many others. When I wrote the biography, The Lives of Lee Miller, it triggered a continuous series of books and exhibitions that actually brings us here today to this very minute. And back home, the old farmhouse, Farley Farmhouse, has become a place of pilgrimage. My daughter Amy helps run tours for the visitors who come from all parts of the world. And she's my co-director at the Lee Miller Archives. And she's been here all this week helping to install the exhibition. Downstairs, you have a show of Haitian photography, which tells me how well you understand and love the medium. And upstairs, you have a truly wonderful team, which includes Barbara and Diane and Luke, with his top-rate team of technicians working miracles at least every 15 minutes, if not more frequently. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing for me to be in a museum which is regularly filled with children, on the kind of educational courses that make me want to join in and listen. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, everyone on the staff of this warm and friendly and delightfully diverse and exciting museum. I feel that in a mysterious way, Lee is here, inhabiting her work, and that she and Amy and I know she is among friends. And that, to me, feels very good. Thank you.